So I want to welcome you to the show. All right. So, um, all right. So uh, this is a very, very special guest today that I have actually known, was it 30 years ago? Damn, isn't that crazy? Golly. <laughs> Hard it, to it's believe. 25 at least. Yeah. Yeah, 25 at least. We but, can stick uh, with 20. <laughs> so I know a lot of your backstory, but my yeah. audience doesn't. And so I love, let's, let's go back. Well, go back as far as you want, but I would like, sure. at least like to start at, um, at UNH. But, you know, I know you have some stories to go a little bit further back. And, and I just want people to understand where you're coming from, because uh, even though I've introduced you uh, a few minutes ago, yeah. you know, you come from both athletic background, not necessarily immigrant, but influence. First generation yeah. Irish immigrant parents. Yeah. I mean, and that blue collar area of Boston. That and, no doubt uh, has an influence. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And business and all that. So, but let's just start at the beginning. So, uh, you know, uh, born and raised in Belmont, Mass, which at the time was either Irish or Italian, right? And, and uh, Irish Catholic. And, we, you know, when we used to play baseball together, my baseball team in, in Belmont was Johnny Fitz, Fitzy, Hubba, Zone, <laughs> Sully, Sully, and Sully, and then Murph. Right. Yeah, right. And so that right, was, right. and it wasn't where you're from. It was what parish, right? So that was the, the kind of the whole Irish Catholic uh, upbringing and as dysfunctional as it was, uh, you know, nostalgic yeah. to look back on right now. So, uh, and then moved around a little bit and, and, uh, so your parents came over from <coughs> both, both from, my from dad. Ireland? So my dad, uh, was born in the States yep. and then they went back when he was a little kid and then, uh, came back. My mom's mom, uh, immigrated to Newfoundland okay. and came down from Newfoundland. Sure. And, uh, so it was a good story. My whole family's, uh, the region is Donegal, the Western yeah. coast of Ireland, which, which is my family's from beautiful, Donegal. which Nat, Nat Geo just named one of the most beautiful places in the world. World, uh, oh, I didn't last know that. year, yeah, yeah, yeah. When I was over in uh, in in Ireland in '78, um, that was when there was a lot of a lot of a problems, lot of troubles, yeah. So yeah, we were in Belfast at the time, Oof, and uh, yeah. you know tanks, and and it's changed quite a bit, yeah. you know, since then. But the checkpoints, yeah. Talk about yeah. you know we're gonna talk about some of the PTSD and stuff. My grandfather oh my gosh, yeah. there, you know, he was one of 16 kids, seeing guns and people getting shot. It's like yeah. no doubt sent him over the edge and we had to leave the city pretty quickly. Absolutely. But that, yeah, it's just no doubt it forms the influence of the, of the Northeast and, and that. And well, you know, that's one of the things I talk about in the book, Bill, is that uh, we make 70 to 80% of our decisions subconsciously. And we do it based on something neuroscientists call prior beliefs. And your prior beliefs are basically your experiences. But the really fucked up thing is we don't create that database. Right, somebody else creates it for us, and your grandfather's a great example. Yes, he yes. Didn't, he didn't choose where he was born. He didn't choose how many brothers and sisters he had. He didn't choose what language he speaks. He didn't choose his religion. He didn't choose the color of his skin, but all those things became his tribe that mm. he identified with. So, unless he did something to enhance that database, yeah. which most people never really have the the consciousness to do then his tribe is going to be the only thing that won't set off his amygdala that won't create these fear responses and that that's at the root essentially of of any war of any conflict and that's sort of so thing. so that so i actually haven't had this conversation with anybody except i don't think one other person but there I, I think that's an area that in your research how much of the past like we have uh, the generation of grandfather or father, grandfather, maybe great grandfather, but there's potentially, you know, just picking on Ireland. It's a windswept island in the middle yeah. of nowhere, and we're just talking about two generations back. What yeah. about 18, 17, 1600s? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And how much of that, those patterns, are we just like, we're, we're just, we just have them, but yeah. we're not conscious of them. Is there any? any? There, there's, there's tons of, of new research about that, and, and I'd say we've got three layers that are really critical. First is just in genetic, right? Why anyone should ever be afraid of snakes in Ireland <laughs> makes no sense, <laughs> right? right? right. Be because one, St. Patrick got rid of all of them. <laughs> so there, is, there are zero deaths every year in Ireland from snake bites, right? Zero deaths. Yep. But, but you'll find 20, 30% of the population is terrified of snakes. That's totally genetic. Right. Okay. That's that's written in the DNA mm. and that, that's why it's there. And that's that's where snakes and spiders and and sharks and other irrational thoughts are. Right. If okay. you if you look at just statistics, we should really be afraid of cars. That's what should terrify us because that's where all the deaths are. The second thing is within a single generation, parents can pass on fears to their offspring 
It's called epigenetics. So parents oh, okay. can actually influence and rewrite your genetics, and most people don't realize it happens that quickly. So it's quick to change. It's not at all fast to get rid of. That's why Irish people are still afraid of snakes. Uh -huh. so, and, then, and then lastly, how we populate our own database can influence it. So those are okay. sort of the three big influences. And, and the ability, one of the biggest takeaways I'd leave, especially for leaders in companies, is trying to replace judgment with curiosity. Mm. And, and one of the easiest examples is, um, you know, if you t took my dad or your dad into uh, Starbucks and you see some kid who looks like he's a victim of a drive-by piercing, right? <laughs> and your, your old man might say, geez, look at what the fuck is wrong with him? <laughs> and, and what you'd find out is, is he's judging based on his tribe. And when you do that, you literally use half your brain. Really? So, okay. so the brain is the, the most energy-hungry organ in the body. It's 5% of the body, but it uses 20% of our energy. So what we try to do is create these shortcuts called valence. So when we some, see something like that, that pierced kid, the pierced barista in Starbucks, we route that immediately to the right side of our brain and just use the right hemisphere to decide that that kid's bad. So basically, if you go back to the, when we were trying to survive a couple million years ago and the software on our amygdala, our fear center, was written, we want to judge within a fraction of a second if I want to kill you or if I want to mate with you, yeah. right? And, and that's basically it. So how can we get the genes to the next generation? So in order to do that, we've had these shortcuts called valence. Now, if we can- How do you spell that? V-A-L-E-N-C-E. E-N-C, -E. e okay. Valence. So if we can stop and, and say, okay, wait a minute. I just said, you know, the, the kid looks really messed up because he's got all those piercings. What can I find- admirable about that mm. and you, you you think for a second and as soon as you start to think as soon as you start that process you you light up the other hemisphere in your brain so now you're literally twice as smart you're literally using twice the the processing power in your brain and so when you stop and try and think that's, that's curious, a powerful question uh, with, with with curiosity you might say well he's probably got a great threshold for pain because i could never put one of those <laughs> little things up in my eyelid like that and he's probably incredibly self-confident because he doesn't care what people think about him. So I really admire that about, about that guy. And then when you go up to him, you're going to have a much different interaction because now you yeah. admire the guy instead of thinking he's a freak because he's not part of your tribe. So, so what do I like about – so do you, can you train that part of the brain like a muscle? So, if, for example, um, an email that comes in or like just what we're involved right now with the, with the virus situation. It's yeah, like, yeah. It, can we train the brain to, um, to be, get in front of it? Like, yeah. can we actually coach it? Yeah. Or, yeah. So you, you have to consciously be aware of that. And one of the stories I tell in the book is, uh, a guy named Ray Dalio, who, uh, one of the richest men in the world, yep. I think he's worth like $20 billion, uh, the CEO of Bridgewater. And he's got a great way of doing it. And he found out by trial and error and, and lost absolutely everything, you know, became this superstar on Wall Street. And then he said, he was asked to testify in front of Congress uh, about the Mexican debt crisis. And he said, look, I've got all of my money shorted. You know, we're, we're selling stocks short. We're putting everything in cash. I've got all my, because I know the market's going to crash. And the chairman of the Fed, who I think at the time was Alan Greenspan, yeah, said, yeah. Um, he said, well, how do you know that? He said, because I'm an expert, I know it. And, and sure enough, the market took off, right? Dalio went out of business, lost millions of dollars. He had to borrow four grand from his dad to start up the company again. He said it was the best experience he's ever had because he went from saying, I know I'm right, to asking himself, how do I know I'm right? Oh, so okay. he stopped when he had that initial feeling. So, you, you know, he, he got the initial gut reaction, which is your subconscious yep. mind thinking. So you're using half your brain when you get it. If you have a lot of experience, it's oftentimes very good and very accurate to do that, that fast thinking. But it's much better if you can incorporate the slow thinking as well and say, okay, here's what I think. The market's going to yeah. tank. How do I know I'm right? And then what that forces you to do is it shuts off the amygdala, which is your reactionary decisions, that fight, flight, or freeze mode. Yep. It opens up the blood-brain barrier, so you're actually getting more processing power using both sides of your brain. So just simply asking yourself, how do I know I'm right? Yeah. Or you know, what can I find admirable? Or what can I like about this situation? What's the benefit? 
And, and being able to take that pause and take that step back allows you to engage the second half of your brain and start to populate that subconscious database we talked about of prior beliefs. You can start to publish or to populate that on your own. You can become responsible for your, your subconscious thinking, for your own internal database instead of where you were born or who your yeah, parents yeah. were or what teacher you had in first grade. Because it's almost like the, you, you can't, we can't use that as an excuse anymore, um, saying, well, that's just you know, how I grew up. Right, uh, right, I right. mean, if, if, I, if we, if we, if we want to go somewhere different or, or be a different type of a leader, it, it's, it, we're almost like uh, defaulting to like a default uh, pattern. So, so that pattern, that's a great point, Murph, because the, the pattern that you're talking about is a defense pattern. So the amygdala, which is our fear center, is the, the amygdala is fully developed actually in the third trimester, even before birth. So at birth, we have the ability to fight, to, to flight, or freeze. So, so we have defense mechanisms from day one. We mm -hmm. have the ability to, to learn how to survive because that was the only thing that was important. That's why we programmed our brain with this two million year old piece of software. Sure. And, and so then we have this other center called the, the Courage Center, the SGACC, the Subgenial Anterior Cingulate Cortex. Nobody's ever heard of that. People have heard of the amygdala. No one's heard of that. I, I could agree with that because I do a lot of reading. And I read, <laughs> I, have, look, I have right here, SGAC, Courage. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Because you like, read the book. <laughs> yes, I read the book. But that, that's brilliant. Look, well, so, keep, talk to me about it because I'm really interested. Because not people have heard about amygdala. Yeah, a lot of people have heard um, more of than, than but, they, but they don't know the Courage Center. Okay. And, and so the reason being, Bill, is, <clears> is from birth, up until the age of about 20, 22 years old, that prefrontal cortex <clears throat> where the SGACC sits, that's that where sits. kind of the okay. adult supervision, that's not fully developed until we're in our early 20s. Mm. So habitually, okay. the first 20 years of our life, our habit is defense because that's all we've got. That's the only tool we're equipped with. Okay. So we default to defense. But in reality, all the potential is in the present. So all of our defense is based on past history, right? We know that if we stick our finger in our socket, we're yeah. going to get shocked. But the PFC doesn't come online until... until well, it starts like, to come online as a teenager okay. in what's called cold cognition, if there's no emotion involved. So you can sit at dinner with your teenager, and they seem like a normal person. They sure. seem like, but as soon as uh, emotion gets involved, it's called hot cognition. They lose the connection, uh -huh. and it starts becoming the amygdala taking control. Okay. So that's why a lot of parents think, well, you know, I sat down at dinner and explained the, the curfew, and then you know, when he went out and his buddy said they could stay out till 1, you know, he flipped out, and it was like a different kid. Well, yeah. it's because there's hot cognition, cold cognition. I got it. But the important thing about the, the defaulting to defense is we do that habitually, but we don't have to. So we can find the, we can find the potential in the present by stopping and asking those questions and stopping and engaging okay. the, the brain and, and stepping back from the situation to shut off the amygdala. And it's, so. and it's basically reprogramming our, our brain for courage and for confidence. And it's so important for leaders, particularly you know, in a field like IT and in an in yeah. environment like this where the pressure's on them to make sure everyone can work from home, to make sure they're staying innovative, to make sure they're, they're satisfying all these different stakeholders, you know, from sales to operations to yep. all this stuff. So if you're, a, if you're an IT guy in leadership, then this is hugely important. So is there, um, I think what... I think what gen, what would be the pushback, and I, this is me pushback, and because I know how hard it is to um, not be hijacked. Yeah. So yeah, I'd love not, that amygdala hijacking. Yeah. So it's like it, th these are nanoseconds, and <clears throat> how do you become super aware so that you can get in front of that hijacking happening? Because getting an email, if you're not super present already, yeah. and you're just in the momentum of the day, yeah. all of a sudden the momentum takes you in a certain path Absolutely. when you're not present. That you're going to regret later. Yeah. So do you have like a, a strategy that some of the, some leader can get, get in front of it? Yeah, so for sure. So the, the, the two ways that we make decisions in life are either out of fear or out of opportunity. And if we make decisions out of fear, it's always going to lead to regret, to shame, to failure. Okay. If we make decisions out of opportunity, that's going to lead to growth, to happiness, to success, and to learning, right? That's how you create a learning organization is make those courageous choices on opportunity. What happens if you get in that reactionary mode, a lot of people don't know it because they don't know what happens to their body 
when, when the amygdala switches on. So when the amygdala switches on, it's there for survival. When it activates that two million year old piece of software, yeah. it's an early warning system for survival. What it wants to do is wake you up so it stops doing anything unnecessary like digestion or procreation or feeling empathy, and it starts doing only what's necessary to survive. It increases oxygen and blood to your, to your brain, opens your ears up so you can hear better, you can see better, uh, creates adrenaline, DHEA, cortisol, all these enzymes start coursing through your body, and you have superhuman powers. That's why if you've ever been to a car accident, yeah. everything looks like it's moving in slow motion. It's because you're taking in twice as much detail as you normally do because you're primed for superhuman performance. Now, if you can step back and recognize when that's happening, okay. you can use that to your advantage. Is that the observer you mentioned? Yeah, the, ex okay. exactly. So that, that you, if you can step back and, and feel that happening, you can have superhuman performance. This is why it's so important to scare yourself every day. Because if you scare yourself on purpose and you can observe what your body feels like, I call them the fear tells. Yeah, so it's yeah. like a, a poker player has these tells when they get a, a good hand or a bad hand, these subconscious things that people can pick up on. The same thing happens when we get scared. So if you do something that scares you, let, let's say you hate public speaking, which yeah. is, I yeah. see it with IT guys all the time. I spoke at a CIO conference in uh, September last year. And I called up five people on the stage, and my God, you, you would have thought I put, you know, like a, we were playing Russian roulette or something. They were so horrible. Just randomly called them up. Yeah, randomly yeah. called them up on stage, and it was it was terrifying. <laughs> so, so if that's you, and and you're listening, and you're afraid to public speak, get up one day when you go to lunch with all your colleagues and make a toast. And when you get up and you you make yourself do that, notice what happens to your body, and you might feel. Uh, butterflies in your stomach, or you might feel like a lead balloon in your stomach, or you might feel your shoulders get tight, or, or your heart start to beat fast, your, your, your breathing getting shallow, something like that. When you start to notice those tells, then you'll notice them during the week. Like mm. when you get that email, all of a sudden you'll say, sure. my leg's shaking, just like when I made that toast. Now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be in a position where I can either react so your body, you're, you're saying the body is in you front of the feel brain. feel it in your body, yeah. Okay, so so totally people, in front of the brain. Okay. Absolutely. It's so a great that, way of saying it too, Bill. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, and I have a couple of different... So I went... Uh, I've been I've been working on these triggers for a while because I, it's been a it's been a problem. So I went to a lot of things. But the, um, the thing that's made the biggest impact, you had a quote from a guy from a CEO in the book that I, I was like, I knew exactly where he was coming from because I went to... Wim Hof's um, mm -hmm. cold training in Poland, and we had to walk up a mountain. Oh, you went to Poland for it? Yeah. Oh, and so, wow, that's awesome. So, and we sat in the, in the cold, and I have a cold plunge at my house now, yeah. and 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 uh, because if doing one thing you're afraid of every day, like yeah. people hate cold. I hate cold to this day. But it's so good for you, immune system, glutathione, uh, yeah, everything. Yeah. But absolutely. the most important thing that I learned was actually the breath work that he taught. Yeah. And he's just stealing it from India and stuff. Two more breathing. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah, it's yeah. it's a it's and it's a it's a pro but then in your book, yeah, th what I liked is that that CEO because I've done the uh, the MBSR, the mindfulness, you know, yeah. the John Kabat-Zinn, like all that's great, but the ultimate thing was that I needed the body in the coolness, so then you can visualize the uh, the negative event or how you want to navigate the negative event, yeah. and settle into it and yeah. breathe. But the biggest thing was the breathing, yeah. And so yeah, I would yeah. love for you if you can explain. And actually, your breathing stuff is not Wim Hof, yeah, which I yeah, thought was even yeah. it was greater because yeah. I was like, man, this is something new. You know? <laughs> so if you can explain your breath thing, because I think that for me was the gateway when that CEO in your book that you quoted, it's like, listen, I've been doing this mindfulness meditation for a long, long time. It's yeah. very powerful. Yeah. But your stuff on the breath work, to me, that shortened meditation from an hour to 10 yeah. minutes. Yeah. And that's it. You don't you, you even like I do two minutes before I go to bed. And what I'm doing is basically decompressing and downloading the, the day and then clearing off my clearing everything in my mind and what's called my working memory so I can sleep. Explain so that can, to people, though, because that's a that's such a cool concept. Sure. I so so I've got a morning routine. I've got a nighttime routine. And part of my nighttime routine is sitting in this this position that I learned when I got leukemia. I had a, a yogi from uh, um, this uh, a Sikh and she was a, a yogi and Kundalini yogi. Okay. And she said, if you can do this one thing called bound lotus, and basically you sit cross-legged in a lotus, and then you cross your arms behind your back, oh, really? and you put your forehead on the ground in, in that position. So, and where are you, what are your knees? Are your knees on? No, you're cross-legged. Cross oh, so you're, really? And you just lean forward? You lotus and, and lean forward. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, so that's cool. Like, the idea is to open up your hips and open up your shoulders and open okay. up your, your knees all at the same time. 
And, uh, and so when I do that, I go through uh, this four by four breathing. And so there's a couple breathing things I, I mentioned in the book, but we'll talk about this one first. It's basically pulling in for a count of four, holding for a count of four, breathing out for a count of four, and then holding out for a count of four. And they teach Navy SEALs this at, at sniper training camp. Yogis have been doing it for years, and, and basically you can think of a box. Okay. The SEALs call it box breathing. Just doing that two minutes every night and, and thinking about all this stuff. Normally before I do, I write down everything I want to do the next day. Mm. Right, so I'll, I'll write down. You know, I've got a podcast with Bill Murphy. I've got uh, you know, Good Morning America at 9 a.m. Uh, I want to bring up the the point about you know this story, that story, and I clear everything out of my mind. Then uh-huh. I do the breathing, and that's that's literally, I mean, literally like five minutes before so, you go to bed, and I sleep like a baby. So you're you're just okay. That's such a great. I love the metaphor because you can everybody can picture their this load of stuff they gathered in their brain yeah. up until that moment when they got to go to bed, and then you're just basically seeding the mind for the next day. Yeah, that's exactly right. And oftentimes, what I'll do, and and I picked this up from one of the neuroscientists I interviewed for the book. Oftentimes, what I'll do if I have a burning question, um, I'll ask myself that before I go to bed, and I'll leave a okay. pen and paper next to the bed. Like an and intention or like something. an intention. Like so, um, I had this keynote for Deutsche Telekom's uh, big kickoff um, two weeks ago, and and this is a huge speech, thousand people, and I yeah. wanted the I wanted the opening message to be really strong and really in- engaging and get yeah. their attention, and so uh, it actually took two nights before you know I said, how am I going to open the speech? I just asked myself that before I went to bed. How should I open the speech? And, and on the second night, <clears throat> you know, I woke up with this great idea. And it was a story I wanted to tell and I wanted to share at some point. But I thought, wow, if I open up with this, yeah. this is going to be really powerful because the ending's so surprising and no one will guess it. And, and, you know, I can do that. So that's how I ended up, you know, coming up with the way that I was going to open up this really important speech. And you can do it for anything, you know. So one of the things I, I thought was really interesting <laughs> about your story, and again, I have an advantage because I, I know your backstory a little bit, mm. uh, although you do talk about it quite a bit in the book, is your athletic background. And, and I find that interesting because there's, there's people listening here who are like, I was a good athlete in the past, yeah. and you know, I've left it all behind for whatever reason, you know, works, kids, and all that. And then, and then you have this talking about courage and, and, and such, and I... I have just just realized this over the past like two years that there's a massive difference between physical courage mm-hmm. and bravery. Like I remember yeah. I, I signed up for the Ironman. We all remember, I mean, you, it, you know, and I remember when I gave him the six hundred dollars. Yeah. Like, and I'm like, what did I just do? And but that took a. I, I knew physically that that was going to be a hard thing, but yeah. it took a different type of a gear. But then when I'm operating red zone, yeah. The, the, the courage is, is psychological. Oh, absolutely. You know, it's mental. So, so we've got three different type of fears, Bill. Okay. And, and I talk about them in the book, and I call it the terror triangle. So if you, if you can imagine a triangle, and on each side of the triangle, one side you've got physical courage, the other side you've got emotional courage, and then down at the bottom you have instinctual courage. And so, excuse me, that's where if you can imagine all your fears living it's someplace within that triangle. So if it's jumping out of an airplane, yeah. it's going to be directly against the physical side, right? Because the, the physical fear is falling, and that's it. If it's getting married or, you know, leaving the military because you've been uh, a Navy SEAL for 15 years, or, um, you know, if it's leaving being a CEO to start a, a photography company, whatever it might be, that's, those are all emotional pains. If it's go back to Ireland, fear of snakes, that's instinctual. So every fear okay. you have is someplace on, inside that triangle. And the interesting thing, I'll go back to the Navy SEALs, because I've worked with a, a bunch of them, is they are the most courageous guys when it comes to physical. Yeah. Right? They can jump out of a plane at 30,000 feet in the pitch black over a stormy ocean and not think twice about it. You'd be yeah. telling jokes as they go out the back of the C-130. Now, a lot of SEALs that I've worked with have been married three times, four times, right? Because... They don't have the emotional training to mm. understand that that's just a fear. That's a fear response they have to train as well. So with each one of those 
uh, legs of the triangle, you've got to train them. So it, sure. it's no different. And, and the fears are no different. So when people are physical, physically courage, courageous, sorry, that, that means they've worked on being physically courageous. Yeah. So if you want to be emotionally courageous, you've got to be vulnerable. And that's really tough. I used to build up uh, the, the old new me that you knew before leukemia, I built up this, you know, this facade. First, it was an athlete, right? And then it was a entrepreneur driving a $150,000 car wearing, you know, $20,000 suits. And, and, and I was running, you know, a $10 million company. And I was thinking I was Gordon Gecko. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it was all to, to hide the shame that I felt about fear. When I got leukemia and I ended up getting out of the hospital and recovering, I went into the office, a whole totally different guy after my immune system was back. And, and I said to, to, you know, we had 30 employees at the time. And I said, look, we, you know, we're screwed. We, you know, we lost that contract. I've been out of the scene for, for, you know, a couple months and, yeah. and we might, we might not make it. And everyone's looking at me saying, who the hell is this guy? You know, what happened to the, I'll take care of it. You know, this is nothing for me yeah. because I, I, I was emotionally much more courageous. I was telling him the truth. I didn't vulnerable. feel like it. Yeah. Much more vulnerable. A hundred percent. Um, I, so I, I, you and I lost touch after the Olympic, um, uh, trials yeah. and we haven't yeah. talked about that and you can weave that in as we go yeah. maybe it's just enough to say you know well it's the second breathing i'll, I'll point that out because you okay. asked about the breathing that's that's in chapter six uh it's a great section for athletes and and for for entrepreneurs about a, a breathing technique and a mind not really mindfulness more a visualization technique yeah i love that i learned at the olympic trials and uh and, and it's really powerful and so, so i i like talking about this concept of intrapreneurs yeah internal and i believe a lot of the cios for them to reach high performance um levels in their business they got to come up less less on defense and more on offense yeah. and that's that entrepreneurship which is you know is a whole nother um skill set but but back to your your point about um uh, that we were just talking about um, uh, with um, the breathing. Yes, the the, the breathing. Right, the as you're so the practical ability to to breathe and just something that people can use day in and day out is like what's the gateway to settle? Because you had this facade, right? Yeah, yeah. And then you and you you got sick and you and you had this like vulnerability, but you were already pretty high performance before that. But yeah. you're saying that we. Some of us are reaching levels, but we got to look behind the curtain a little bit and just Absolutely. say, you know, what is it that I'm I'm hiding from? Yeah, and and, is, and and that will, you know, I tell people all your dreams are on the other side of fear, but you have to you have to run towards that fear. And the reason, so you know, I got second in the Olympic trials and raced the World Cup for for three years. My first company, I raised about thirty million dollars in venture capital and debt, and we sold it, and venture capitalists made all the money. So. I, I tell people if I knew what I knew then, what I know now about courage and, and confidence and, and working in the face of fear, I would have been an Olympic gold medalist and I'd probably be a billionaire, right? Because my motivation and my methods were all wrong. I had this tremendous potential, like yeah. thank God for my parents because I had good genetics and good coaching. But because my motivation was wrong, um, or let's say, you know, it wasn't, wasn't optimal, put it that way. When I, when I got at Hopkins and I was told that the, the odds were I wouldn't get out, right? They asked if my affairs were in order. Um, you know, my daughter was a year old. My wife was six months pregnant. And so I sat there in Hopkins thinking, memory Shannon is going to have of her dad is the guy who's too big of a pussy to get on a plane and take her to Disney World or take her to Paris or take her anywhere in the world yeah. because he's, he's so cowardice, he's so cowardly, and he doesn't, have the, he doesn't have the wherewithal to get over his own fears and to, to face those fears. So when I got out, that became my motivation. And I don't know anyone listening to this podcast who wouldn't run into a burning building. You know, you'd run into a burn, burning building to save your kid. Yeah. So if every day becomes your burning building, if you've got a chance to make a decision based on fear or based on opportunity, and you feel that change in your body, then you say, okay, that's my early warning system, not, not for survival anymore. That's my early warning system for opportunity. Mm. Now, if I decide my burning building might be standing up telling the CEO, I got a much better idea, I got something that's risky that I wanna try, and it's putting myself on the line, but that's where the opportunity lies. And, that's the and, magic my, right there. and my little girl, 
wants me to take that opportunity and I want to do it for her. And now, now you've got the motivation, you've got the recognition of when that happens because you've got this incredible early warning system, right? And, and now you can run towards that fear knowing the opportunity and your dreams are on the other side of it. And, and, and for you, the, for, for you discovering the shame around, um, essentially what you, even though you've been, you were quite successful the the, uh, the 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 sh- you're essentially using the motivation of that that shame and fear yeah. to create your acceleration yeah. versus being aware that th- that this was there and it creates you're saying that it creates a different type of acceleration oh, in your life so much more powerful okay so, it's such a faster acceleration if you've got that authentic courage okay if you're constantly trying to hide your shame and constantly trying to hide your fear and, and trying to create your, your persona. Yep. Pe- people make the mistake, Bill, all the time of thinking, well, I'll, I'll act, create, or sorry, I'll, I'll think and I'll tell myself and I'll use positive motivation to tell myself I'm going to be courageous, then I'll act courageous. It's the other way around. They've got it all wrong. You have to act courageous to feel courageous. Right? You can't feel it and say, okay, now I'll act that way. You've just got to do it, and it's going to feel horrible. Yeah. Right? It'll feel so foreign if, if you're the type of guy like me who is trying to cover things up and act the yeah. part and when you actually, when you actually uh, don't feel it. Right? So, so that's the first step, and I think that's the big difference in motivation between you know, when you've got this self-motivation and you're trying to create a persona – Versus when you're being the authentic you and, and you're doing things for the right reason. So what happened when you when you told that story to the thirty employees um, and you came in? What what? It, it was what, incredible. What, really? Yeah, I, I mean, I was shocked because they a couple guys came up and they said, "Well, you know that contract we just lost. We know the we know the prime contractor. They'll probably want some help. Why don't I call them up and see if we can get a couple guys on that deal?" Someone else said, okay. "Well, you know what? There's this other thing," and and rather than um, you know, me having to shoulder that whole burden myself, all of a sudden everyone's saying, Hey, we can, we can fix this. You sure. know, we can, we can jump in and, and it just became such a better work environment, right? Because we started being way more transparent with each other, or I started being yeah. more transparent with everybody else. And, and consequently they became more transparent with me. Did the bravery, we talked about fearlessness. Do you, did your, did your experience at Hopkins with the leukemia, did that, that, did that make you fearless or did it make you more brave? It, it definitely, case? definitely bravery and, and courage. And the distinction I draw there, Bill, is um, that that old me died yeah. at Hopkins, right? That part that was trying to trying to create the image and, and sure. you know yeah. trying to be the bravado tough guy um, that died at Hopkins, and the the real me emerged. And what I found was. Uh, and, and, and near-death experiences oftentimes reprogram people's mind when they go through okay. it. You'll hear a lot of cancer survivors say it was the best thing that ever happened to me. And, and because their mind got reprogrammed. Okay. The good news is after interviewing 36 neuroscientists, we don't have to go through that near-death experience to reprogram your mind. You can use the, the base platform I lay out in the book, which is all based on neuroscience. And, and basically what you're doing is you're able to say, when I'm fearful, I feel it and yeah. I know it. I'm going to face that fear. I'm going to I'm going to run towards it, and that's what courage is. So courage is like Sully Sullenberg, right? The guy who landed yeah. the the uh, jet on the Hudson River with no engines, right? So he's he is in a state of abject panic, right? He's got 200 people behind him. He's over New York City, and his engines go out. You can't be any more scared than that. But he had such courage. That he said, okay, I'm going to go through my checklist. I'm, I've been trained to do this. I'm going to take that fear. I'm going to put it in a compartment, get yep. it out of the way right now because it's not serving me, and I'm going to do exactly what I need to do to get out of this situation. That's, that's bravery, okay. right? That's, that's courage. I don't want fearlessness because fearlessness like to that. me is, is just being used to something. It, it's habitual. It's, it's, yeah. it's numb, right? So, so if you've done something, if you've jumped out of a plane a thousand times, when you go up there and you jump out a thousand and one times, it's, your heart rate's probably the same yeah. as it was, you know, at nine, 999. And it's kind of ho-hum. You've lost that, that uh, fear of it. So, so fearlessness, I think people say that and they use it incorrectly. What I want is bravery. What I want is courage. What I want is confidence. And that's, okay. I think that's way more valuable. So the, uh, when people come to you and, and say, what can I do now? Like what, and the, the, the book is, 
uh, an amazing resource. And and are you often asked to, to say, is there some practical things that I can take home and test um, on myself uh, today? And and, I, and I'm being like really, really, really practical about like you have a, a leader who has to execute on this project, but has to have like three hard conversations. Yeah. And they got to have it not like four weeks from now. They got to have it within a week. Yeah. Uh, yep. Or two weeks. Sure. And is there like uh, like how would you coach them to get through to the get to the to the other side of that where they can have those and be brave and be courageous and be a leader during that process? I think there's two important things to go through long term. One is trying to discover your fear tells those things I said you should scare yeah. yourself about. The second is trying to find your hidden fears and and your fear frontier because there's a, a dark side or as I say in the book there's a shadow side to those. Those are a little bit longer and, and take a while to explain and to walk through. And I, I do that occasionally with some CEOs and have had some just incredible results and, and super breakthroughs that, that are just skyrocketing people to the next level because they figured out their hidden fears and what their defenses are against them. To answer your question more specifically, if you have something you've got to deal with in the next week, the best thing I think you can do um, is what the Stoics call premeditation of evil. Ah, I love that. So, yes, yes. So if you can, if you can sit down, do some four by fours. So the breathing is always the key. Anytime okay. you you feel yourself activated, do those four by fours. Even if you don't feel yourself activated, like at night or when you wake up in the morning, doing a few four by fours just gets you used to focusing on your breathing and brings your attention inward, yeah, right? Yeah. So super easy practice. And when you do, if you sit there and you think about what you have to do that you've got trepidation about, what's really important, I want you to see yourself doing it, see it going great. A lot of people say, you know, visualize yourself winning and everything else. That's perfect. Do that. Do that the first time, maybe the first couple of times. But then I want you to see yourself going sideways and things going the worst possible way you can imagine it. And see yourself having that conversation with your CEO and him throwing a, you know, a, a pen holder across the desk at you, screaming at you, asking how outcome. he could have hired an idiot. And, you know, yeah. think of the worst outcome possible. Then think of how you responded to it. And what you're doing from a neuroscience perspective is you're putting in prior beliefs into your subconscious database. Right, so when you get to your boss or whoever you have to have that tough conversation with, now you have all these prior beliefs of, let's say, 10 different things that you envisioned happening yep. from really good to really bad. None of them are gonna come as a surprise. So it's, our, our brain is a prediction engine, right? We try, we try to figure out how this event that we're in right now is gonna turn out. The way we figure it out is based on our past history or our prior beliefs. So we'll use those to predict the outcome of this moment. So if all of a sudden you hadn't done that visualization and your boss flips out and throws that pen thing at you, you don't have, you, you don't have a prior belief that aligns with it. This is why the coronavirus is, is yeah. scaring so many people. There is no prior beliefs that say what's going to happen with this virus. So there's uncertainty. Yeah, when there's yeah. uncertainty, we create something called free energy. And that free energy is the root of all fear. Uh, so okay. if you've thought through all the possible scenarios, when you go talk to you know, the, the person you have to talk to and they throw the, the thing across, what you'll find yourself doing is just what you're doing now, Bill. You'll say, huh, I saw this coming. Let me get you to sure. sit down. I just want to say something again because I think I spoke wrong. So just let's take a seat. Let me explain it. And, and you're not flustered. And you're not thinking, what the, what the hell are you doing throwing that shit at yeah. me? Right? You know, yeah. And it becomes a much more manageable and you're using both hemispheres of your brain at the same time so you're crafting that you're crafting uh the neural the, the neural response yep. well ahead of time you're getting, it, you're getting out you're getting out in front of it exactly okay. you're, you're getting out in front of it with your prefrontal cortex okay. with the adult supervision with yeah. the sgacc with that courage center you're not letting the amygdala hijack like you were saying because if you didn't do that and things went sideways the amygdala is going to say okay we're in a threat here our default is to defense, yep. right? So we've got to stop that default to defense, and we've got to find all the potential in the present. And, and most people can visualize, and there's a whole part of this on visualization, and, yeah. and you have a whole process of working people through that. Do, to, are people generally, I'm very visual, are people generally able to light up their brain with a visual, like imagining themselves in the situation and the feelings they get? Yeah, I, I would say probably 80% of okay. the population is really um, able to lean in and do that. Other people tend to be either auditory, you know, using okay. ears or kinesthetic, which is what yeah. they talk about neuro-linguistic programming and, and things like that. So, But I would say probably 80% of the population can get the visualization. 
The, the truth is how your brain is wired. Um, we've got something called neuroplasticity, which means the brain can change at any age. We used mm. to think just up until you know, 15 years ago that at, at age 20 it was fully developed. But the truth of the matter is it changes over time. So we can, we can become more visual if we want to, if we okay. practice being visual, if we practice visualization, it'll have more and bigger impact on us for sure. Um, a lot of the older folks, let's say 45 plus that are listening, um, so they have a lot of the young bucks coming up that, um, you know, it's just a different brain. I imagine there's a different brain in the yeah. 20s and 30s. And with, from a leader perspective, um, you know, you have this deep well of experience yeah. ar around you. So technically, I guess you could be called wise. But yeah. wise can get in the way at times because you have this prior experience. Yeah. So do you have like a... Um, uh, how do you how do you make someone actually wise? Yeah, and so they're not like layering their past beliefs into yeah, something. Sure, because that's one of the advantages folks that are younger have. They don't have the the trauma of yeah. of getting yelled at by four or five bosses. Well, they do have the trauma from from back in their youth, and and that's really important. They have their fear frontier. They have their defense mechanisms, and millennials particularly have had, um, I think, a disservice from their parents, right? Because parents became affluent and they tried to protect them so much that uh, they've had to face a lot less challenges than guys like you and I did growing up. You know, I was the first person in my family to graduate college and I had to pay for college myself and pay for grad school myself. And so yeah. had all these challenges and potentially of not being able to pay the next semester and, you know, was I going to get kicked out and, sure. and all these type of things, whereas my kids, for example, they're, you know, they're expecting to go to a $70,000 a year college, have dad cut a check and not yeah. have to worry about anything. So it's a totally different mindset where there's not a lot of threat. There's not a lot of um, challenge that, yeah. that comes their way compared to the older guys. So the older guys oftentimes have a great way of looking at their life as something that they created. And one of the things that, that I found with the younger set it, that prevails until they have those bosses that are jerks and those experiences that, that make old guys wise is that they tend to think of themselves as victims. And you can hear it in the language that, that they use. If they say, you know, God, I would have been here on time, but the traffic was just awful. Yeah. And that, that um, client is really an asshole. We would have, we yeah. would have, we would have grown this, this contract if it wasn't for him. So that's a total victim mindset, yep. right? When you're a victim, I, I have this thing that I call the drama triangle from uh, my friend Diana Chapman. And when you're a victim, there's always a villain. Right. So some, somebody's always a villain, villain. And to get yourself out of it, you know what you need? Uh, no. We a need hero. A hero. Oh, okay. <laughs> right? So the hero's got to come <laughs> in. So that's the drama triangle. If you're a villain, I mean, if you're a victim, you got to have a villain, someone to blame everything that goes wrong on. And then you've got to have a hero, someone yeah. who can come in and fix it for you. And so oftentimes you'll see this in, in people who aren't successful at work. They'll say, you know, that, that boss is a jerk. He keeps holding me. He keeps giving me these bad assignments. He keeps yeah. doing this. It's all his fault. That means life is happening to you to, yeah. when, when that happens. If life is going to happen by you, then you change from being a victim to being a producer. And that same boss isn't a villain anymore. He's a challenger. Sure, and, sure. And now he's challenging me to think, well, how could I have done that better? What could I do differently? What's he looking for? And then if you need help, you don't get a hero. You've got a coach. Yeah, right. right. Someone who's going to say, have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? And it all comes down. So going from that drama triangle to that producer triangle yep. all comes down to curiosity. So if okay. you believe, if you have a mindset that everybody here put on this earth is here so you can learn. Everyone is here so Bill Murphy can get better at what he does. The world is a very friendly place, and I know you're here to serve me. And, and if you have that mindset, you might think, well, it's, it's manifesting itself in a yelling, screaming fit, so how do, I, how do I do better next time? How do I understand this? How can I you know, make sure things don't work out? And what you'll see in, in really successful people, and you mentioned CIOs. I've got a friend of mine who was the CIO of Capital One for the first uh, 15 years that they were around, Jim Donahue. And, uh, and he was the best at that. He'd have the two guys, Rich and Nigel, the two founders of Capital One, screaming at him about you know, the fact that he wanted to try outsourcing this new, uh, this new storage backup. And they're like, we can't let this go. It's, our, you know, it's all our credit card information. And he'd just sit there like, like Yoda, right? <laughs> you, you know, with it, without batting an eyelash. And he'd be thinking to himself, well, 
why did I do a bad job presenting it so these guys don't understand what a good thing it was? How can I do better next time? And yeah. he turned internal and said, this is a great challenge. And, and he became legendary in terms of CIOs. Well, that comes back to the, one of the first questions is, you know, what, what do I like about this? But it's asking better questions. Yeah, yeah, um, that's asking. it. Um, well, I look at you, and you know, as, we, as, we, as we wrap up, Patrick, you know, I look at you as a, uh, I came up with this, and I stole it, but it's, I, I like to try mentors. Everybody says you need a mentor. Yeah. But I, I, I look at it a little bit differently, and as I get older, it's um, when it pick, being selective about mentors. And I, and I talk about this quite a bit with my CIO group because it's, we're reaching an age where it's impossible to know everything. Mm. It used to be you know, 15, 20, 25. You could actually be smart and know everything. But right now, it's just too fast and so too much wide, yeah. Yeah. too much uh, complexity. We need, and so as you select mentors, I look at you as a trifecta mentor. Okay. You know, when you read, the, so, okay. Um, I, do I want to learn business? That's the biggest payoff, right? Yeah. <laughs> we're, we're coming up on <laughs> Kentucky Derby day here in about right, a month, right? right? So we want the trifecta. <laughs> do I want the business? Do I want the academics? And yeah. do I want a blend of both? Like success is, 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 and I might even put in some of the, the, the health experiences you've had. Yeah. You know, you look at this from a continuum and from the, as one reads the book, it's like, okay, well, this is not an academic exercise on success. There's yeah. the athletic success that you've had, and then there's the business success, and then and then there's the health um, that, that you've been over to um, to navigate through. And and you look at it, and, and then there's the academics in the book of yeah. like what's the real science the behind this. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and and so some of it, and so I look when you look at this all together, I just call it like a trifecta mentor, and that's mm -hmm. why I think you know. Reading the book and listening to this podcast is super because it can be like a voice, you know, that you, yeah. someone's playing to kind of coach them up as they're driving to work or whatever it may be. But do you ever have people come to you? Um, and what is your thoughts on mentors and and how people can accelerate their progress in life by surrounding themselves with people just a little bit in front of them in areas? So I think, um, you know, one of the one of the early mistakes I made in my first company, Server Vault, um, was the the board management. Because your board of directors should be mentors. And instead, I was so terrified with every board meeting that we would literally spend a week of, of time prepping for prepping. the board meeting. Sure. Yeah, doing a great board book, putting everything together, trying to anticipate every answer. And that was such a big mistake, right? Because that became me wasting a week yeah. to, to try and look good. Again, it was all about this image, to try and look good in front of the board. Sure. And, and instead, when I got to Odin, I bootstrapped that company instead of raising money for it. And I put together a killer board and would just walk in and say, this really sucks, can't do this, I don't know why this failed, and uh, I need help here. And, and it became much more of, um, uh, I, I was looking actively for criticism. I'd say that's the, that's the that's biggest thing you can do from a mentor. Is, is try and find someone who will give you critical feedback and, and not, you know, not feel bad about it, not take it personally, yep. not find someone who's going to sit around blowing sunshine up your ass and make you feel good about yourself, but someone who will give you critical feedback who will say, you know, this is, this is where you could have done better, this is where um, you did well, and this is what you got to work on next time. And I think if you're going to get a mentor relationship, it's great to have someone who will give you a pat on the back every now yeah. and then, but that's a lot less valuable than someone who's going to give you that real critical feedback and then help you navigate how you can get to to a point where you know that that doesn't become a weakness. It's funny that uh, your process from the I just formed a board as well and and they make me nervous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And and it can be I can I know with your thinking it, it can take you out of sort of your brain pattern or normal brain pattern because you're. You, you, these are high performers and you want to do good. You yeah. want to present yourself well, but you want that feedback. And it's like, and I, I, cause I remember I was interviewing for the board members and one of them said, said to me, well, here's the, here and he goes, well, I would just toss that back. I said, what if I had a problem? How would you approach that? And he goes, I would just toss it back to you and tell you to go figure it out. Yeah. And this is a guy is a board member of like publicly traded companies. And I get that, you know, yeah. it's like, they want the CEO to figure it out, but I was like, you know, I need a collaborate. I need a collaborative uh, person to yeah, work with. Yeah. And yes, I want to feel uncomfortable. And to your point about comfort, but I don't want to be so uncomfortable that that I'm like I have a facade, you know, or yeah, I can't yeah. ask vulnerable questions, yeah, or yeah. I come across as the CEO and it's a 40 person company for God's yeah, sake. You yeah, know, this exactly. is we're not running a multinational, yeah. you know, GE Capital or something. <laughs> so, it's I appreciate that 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 feedback because I think that's 
maps to the vulnerability um, yeah. and some of the the, the, uh, the the small business owners that are listening to this. And I know you're involved in YPO quite frequently yeah. Yeah. and how they surround themselves with people that can uh, help them solve problems and, 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 um, and grow their businesses and help employ people. That, that was So I've been in YPO for uh, more than a dozen years. And when, when, when you join YPO, Young Presidents Organization, you get a um, you get put in what's called a forum with seven or eight other people, and we just had this amazing forum of of eight people, so uh, six guys, two women, and of the eight of us that started in this forum, six of us now have different careers. Wow! Because we went, we had a group of mentors, a group of of peers who we could be totally vulnerable with, totally honest, and tried to figure out when we were in our genius. And, and when we were, you know, in, in that zone of excellence, which we're really good at, we yeah. get paid a lot of money for, but it's really work. The, the zone of genius, which is where you want to spend at least 80% of your time, is when you're in that flow state, when things come easily, and you're really good at it. And you look at the clock and you think, holy cow, three hours just, just flew by, and I, you know, I didn't even realize it. And it's, it's the type of thing you'd do even if you had a billion dollars in the bank. And so that's, I think... You know, that's one of the benefits that can come from a mentor group or come from like your CIO yeah. group when you when you're getting point. input yep. beyond something like, you know, just what a, a boss would give you or what uh, you might get 100%. in a 360 review. Yeah. It's going to be impossible for us to cover everything in the book in one. Well, and show. then no one would buy the book. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> but uh, I'm going to put it show notes for this. Fear is fuel. The surprising power to help you find purpose, passion and performance by Patrick Sweeney. So I'm uh, I'm I'm thrilled to, to have been one of the first to, to interview you, and I think the long tail on this is going to be you're going to be surprised with the long tail on this. I think it's going to it has evergreen value. Yeah, I, think. I, I hope so. Uh, I, I think you know, Bill, we were thrilled that it sold out in the first printing, so the second one is due on Patty's Day, which I love. Nice, <laughs> nice, that's good. That's March seventeenth. So uh, I I think so, and and you know that was really a a work of passion. It spent it was six years of me. Just trying to figure out a way to help other people learn confidence and courage without without having to go through a near death experience. Is there anything that we um, didn't cover or any point that you wanted to make um, related to this or your legacy or anything that's um, bigger vision that you wanted to share before we wrap yeah, up? Yeah, so, something maybe not a bigger vision, but something came to mind, Bill, when we were talking about CIOs, and um, uh, it, it was it was just what what popped up for me. And that is that a, a lot of my friends who were very successful technology guys, CIOs, CTOs, and everything else, never took care of their bodies. And, and I always think a sound mind in a sound body. And, um, you know, when I was, before I got leukemia, I was drinking six Diet Cokes a day. Um, you know, would would go to uh, would go to McDonald's or Subway or whatever, scarf down, you know, whatever we could. And I wasn't even, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't exercising other than, you know, kind of hitting the gym in the morning yeah. a little bit. And then afterwards, you know, when I got leukemia, I had to change my diet. And this is 15 years ago. Um, I started doing something called the maker's diet, which turns out now people call uh, a ketogenic diet. Oh, nice. And, okay. And um, stopped doing that. It started having meetings by walking around the building. You know, just little sure. stuff. You don't have to go do a, an Ironman like you were saying. But just the fact that if you, and there's great studies, there's one of the guys I interviewed from Harvard, John Ratte, wrote a book called Spark. And Spark's a good book. Yeah, yeah. and it's, it's all about how exercise and movement affect your brain yep. and how it makes you smarter. And if you're a CTO and you're trying to think innovatively, go out and take a walk. You know, get, a, a, get out, get some exercise, but, but take care of your body, watch your diet, especially now you know, with the coronavirus coming around, it's a good opportunity for all of us to think, am I doing everything I can? You mentioned I do cold showers every morning as part of my morning routine. So cold showers, breathing, some exercise, you know, and, and watching your diet. So I'd, I'd say that's I probably that. the last piece of advice that came up. No, I'm so glad you brought that up. That's, um, yeah, I mean, it's, you got to have some, we're talking a lot about the body, yeah. being aware, and, and, and um, I, I love that. That's a great way to end. Awesome. Thank you for coming. Bill, thanks for having yeah, me. Yeah, it's, it's great fantastic. to catch up, brother. All right. Cool.